In this lesson, we'll talk about two dominant systems developed for large-scale graph processing. The first one, called Giraffe, is from Apache and implements a BSP model on Hadoop. The second system is called GraphX, is developed on the Spark platform, which, as you know, emphasizes on iterative in-memory computations. While BSP is a popular graph processing model, the actual implementation of BSP in an infrastructure needs additional programmability beyond what we have discussed so far. In Giraffe, several additional capabilities are added to make it more practical. A thorough coverage of the Giraffe platform is beyond the scope of these lectures. However, we'll touch upon a few of these capabilities. We'll first consider Graph I.O. That is how graphs can come into the system, get represented inside the system, and when computed, are written out to files. Next, we'll describe how Giraffe interacts with external data sources. Some of these data sources use a different data model. Other sources include databases. Once a graph is imported, it is important to make sure that the system runs efficiently. We will look at a method that uses a special kind of global aggregate operation, which saves time by reducing the amount of messaging to compute aggregate functions like sum and products. Finally, we'll recognize that even if Giraffe is designed for performing iterative in-memory computation, there are times when it is absolutely necessary to store data on disk. We'll briefly touch upon Giraffe's ability to handle out-of-core graphs and out-of-core messages. A graph can be written in many ways. For Neo4j, we saw how graphs can be important to the database from a CSV file. In Giraffe, two of the most common input formats are adjacency lists and edge lists. For an adjacency list, each line has the node ID, a node value, which is a single number here, and a list of destination weight pairs. Thus, in line 1, A has a value of 10, and two neighbors B and F with edge weights 2 and 5, respectively. Since G has no outgoing edge, the adjacency list is empty. The ultimate way of representing graphs is in terms of triplets, containing the source and destination nodes, followed by an edge weight. Notice the way that we have shown it here, and the node value is not represented. Let us simplify the adjacency list representation a little. We remove the colons, commas, braces, and parentheses, and get a space-separated set of lines, one line for each vertex. We further replace the node IDs A, B, C, etc. with 1, 2, 3, etc., so that these IDs are integers. So what do we need to specify to parse this for giraffe? One, the graph is a text object, and not, let's say, a database object. Two, it is a vertex-based representation. Each line is a vertex. The splitter here is a space. The ID of the node is a first value for each line. The value is a second token. The next pair of items define an edge with the target and the weight, respectively. And lastly, there is a list of these pairs till the end of the line. Therefore, each line would typically lead to the creation of both nodes and a set of edges. This shows a typical reader for an adjacency matrix written in Java. Again, you don't have to know Java to get the elements of this program. A reader is clearly customized for your specific input. Very often, the starting point is a basic reader, reader provided by Giraffe. Like the reader that knows how to read vertices from each line of a text file. To customize it, you extend it and create your own version. Now you need to define how to get the ID and value of the vertex by writing separate methods for them. Notice that the ID comes from the zeroth item of each line after it is split by white space, and the value comes from the next token, the second term, marked by 1 for the zero base of the line. The next code element is this block here. This specifies how to create edges by iterating through every line. To keep the code short, we remove the part that gets the edge weights here. 
As Giraffe has matured, it has included many specialized wrappers to interoperate with compatible data sources. This diagram is from Giraffe, where they show some of these sources. We can group them into three different categories. Group 1 interoperates with Hive and HBase. You possibly remember these systems from a prior course. These systems are designed to give a higher level data access or interface on top of MapReduce. Group 2 accesses relational systems like MySQL and Cassandra. But these systems are accessed indirectly through a software module called Gora. Gora uses a JSON schema to map the relational schema of the SQL database to a structure that Giraffe can read. Group 3 accesses graph databases like Neo4j and DEX, which is now called Spark C. These systems are also accessed indirectly using the Rexter service of Tinkerpop, which is a graph API layer that can use many different graph stores, including BlazeGraph and Titan. Consider a relational table stored in Hive. The table shown here is extracted from the BioGrid data source that we mentioned in Module 2. Each row of the table represents a molecular interaction. We can create a network from here just by considering the first two columns. The first column represents the source node of an edge, colored red, and the second column represents the target node of the edge, colored blue. The label of the edge comes from the fifth column of the table, which is a black bold font. Let's assume that these two data items, uh, these are the data items that we want to pick up from the Hive table. The simplest way to get a record from Hive to Giraffe is to extend the class called simple Hive row to edge. For this class, we need to specify the source node, the target node, and the edge value using three methods as shown here. My extension is called my Hive row to edge. It shows the implementation of these methods where we just pick up the first, second, and fifth columns as we described before. Now, as mentioned before, Giraffe interacts with Neo4j through the Gremlin API provided by Tinkerpop. One can think of Gremlin as a traversal API, which means it allows one to start from some node and walk the graph step by step. To show this, Consider the disease gene graph on the right. Let's call this graph G. So G dot V represents all the vertices of G. Therefore, G dot V has, has name MC4R, selects the node that has the property called name, whose value is MC4R. Let's add to this path the condition dot out, which chooses the out edges of the MC4R node and then traverses the associated with edge to the orange node called obesity. So this call returns the vertex only. Now adding the path to values name gives us obesity. We can also expand differently from the obesity node. When we say in V, we refer to all nodes that have incoming edges to the current node. In this case, there is only one, the LEPR node. To this, we add the traversal out E, and thus we get back the outgoing edge from the LEPR node highlighted in yellow. We can also look at the Giraffe Gremlin Neo4j connection from Tinkerpop's viewpoint. Tinkerpop is trying to create a standard language for graph traversal, just like Neo4j is trying to create OpenCypher as a standard query language for graph databases. In trying to create this standard, Tinkerpop recognizes that the actual storage management for graph databases should be provided by another vendor. The vendor needs to implement the Gremlin API for access. Similarly, for graph processing, including expensive analytic operations, should be performed by what they call a graph computer. This is the role played by Giraffe as well as Spark, both of which interface with Tinkerpop.